Jack, I believe on our show, Film Courage, when you came into the studio, you talked about Orson Welles briefly, and you talked about how he mentioned this 90-10 rule right. about filmmaking, and that 90% of it is hustling, and 10% of it is creativity. You know, and in following Orson Welles' story recently, I've become very intrigued with him. What do you think it was that was his sort of downfall, aside from maybe addiction or something? Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he was basically handed the keys at right. a very young age, he was sort of a child prodigy, and things didn't turn out as you would think that they would in the end for him. Yeah, no, Orson Welles' story is a um, is a really interesting one. It's funny because I think I remember a Spike Lee interview where they asked him why he was so into being a businessman and why at the, I think at the time he had a store and all these things and he was making commercials. And, he said something about he never wanted to wind up selling wine as an old man, you know, which is what Wells ended up doing, basically, you know, kind of shilling, maybe selling wine as a, as, a, as a personality in a commercial, as opposed to making all the films that he should have been allowed to make. Um, in fact, I think Wells' quote about 90% hustling and 10% creativity in filmmaking is probably, I think he actually probably even said it was, Les probably said it was 95% um, hustling, but, uh, yeah, I think it's interesting. I think that people resented him from the beginning because he did, he was given this this sort of creative autonomy that nobody got, ever. I mean, he came into town as a radio celebrity and was given by RKO, you know, carte blanche. Like, make anything you want as long as it's this budget. Star in it, write it however you want. We're not going to give you any notes. Just make it. And you've got all these directors who had been in town, you know, had been making films since The Silence for 25 years, and they're like, who's this little shit kid who gets, 20-something kid that gets all the, all the creative control in the world, and I still have to, like, listen to studio notes, and I've made 50 movies, and, you know, and I've got to, like, recut my movie per, you know, Louis B. Mayer or whatever. And so I think people resented him. And it's like anything, and, and they, they, when, when you resent somebody like that and he has power like you, like you, we want him to fail. Um, I also think a part of it has to do with the fact that Citizen Kane was such a monumental achievement the first time out of the gate that it was impossible for him to match that level of, uh, that power that came out of, out of Citizen Kane. Even though his subsequent movies are all fantastic in and of themselves, it's it's like you make the you make the towering achievement and then it's all downhill from there. I think he always he always said that. You know, it's very difficult to make your best work first because how do you how do you how do you follow that? But I think that people unfairly said that he was um, somebody who, who went over budget and over schedule because actually, if you look at the documentation, he was actually um, very frugal and very he wasn't this crazy you know out of control genius. Uh, which makes the story even more tragic. You know, one of the things that always upset me was that when uh, he was older and still trying to get financing, that you know people like Spielberg would spend you know million dollars on the Rosebud sled, you know, at, to buy as a personal memento. I can't remember how much it was, but it was a lot of money. But he, they wouldn't help him get a movie made. So they admired him. And yet, they weren't able to executive produce Orson Welles's Vlad, maybe his last movie. I mean, it wasn't like he was asking for zillions of dollars. Um, so he remains this tragic figure, and uh, and infinitely interesting because he was such a brilliant filmmaker. Because he had such a command of the medium. I mean, there are very few filmmakers where you feel that they have like complete command over the medium. There's some directors that are actors directors. There's some directors that are visual directors. There's some directors that have no idea how to edit or, or use sound. And this was clearly a man who intuitively had this um, way with film and all in all its various aspects. So that's why they're so alive. All those, even the ones that fail are interesting because there's always something going on. I'm wondering, with that failure, do you think that's a very common thread that people self-sabotage because they do get set up, or there is resentment, and they they almost feel guilty? Maybe it's funny when you look at people who. It's interesting to look at the films, the second films of people that have made monster hits. Like I've always looked at, like for example, William Friedkin, who like you know, had the success of The French Connection and The Exorcist, and then was basically given, again, like carte blanche, like, okay, you're, you're made these monster commercial critical hits, make whatever you want, I don't care how much it costs. And he makes a movie called Sorcerer, which is this remake of this, of the great 
uh, Henri Clouseau film Wages of Fear about about desperate men driving nitroglycerin through a jungle with Roy Scheider. Two studios made, it took two studios to finance Sorcerer. Nobody knows that movie. Nobody, and that's like a gigantic movie. And it's actually a very, very good movie. But you get the feeling like, why are you calling it Sorcerer? I mean, the word Sorcerer makes it sound like it's about wizards and stuff. And uh, it had Roy Scheider at the top of his popularity. It's a big action adventure picture. Um, with incredible set pieces and suspense, and nobody gave a shit. Nobody saw that movie. It was like, killed it. And the same thing happened, obviously, with Michael Cimino. You know, he makes Deer Hunter, and then you follow it with this, you know, the biggest disaster of all time, Heaven's Gate. You know, so there maybe is something. I think probably maybe there maybe there is a degree of self sabotage or guilt, but there's also this kind of like. Um, okay, now I'm gonna, like, now that I have the power, I'm going to make the thing I always wanted. And maybe that thing isn't necessarily the most commercial thing, which is how Hollywood measures success. So I'm grateful for, for movies like Sorcerer and Heaven's Gate because you get to see something realized that would, would never have been realized had these directors not made these super popular movies. But I, oddly enough, these are like, these are like the things that kill sometimes careers, so. I don't know. I haven't been, <laughs> I haven't been in a situation yet where I was made something that I was so successful that I decided to destroy my own career with the next film. You know, maybe. Hopefully, I get there. Then I can do that. Yeah.